Now contamination in fuel systems is a big problem, increasing problem because there's there's no there's, there's such a wide variety of fuel available out there. People can contaminate their fuel systems by uh, losing fuel caps, not replacing the fuel filter as often as they should do, and again like putting the wrong fuel in there. Okay, so contaminated fuel systems can be water and petrol, um, or um, dirt poor quality fuel. The picture we have here shows you quite a significant amount of um, contamination. Now I'm just going to cover the particular um, scenario behind this one, the diagnostics P0093 large leak in the fuel system. So as I said it's not an external leak, it's an internal leak and it's pretty much was created because the actual fuel pickup in the tank was completely blocked and this is it here. The fault was actually occurring on a hill in the same place in Sydney in a suburban street. It kept logging that fault code, okay? So on that certain hill got to a certain amount of load, it couldn't pull the fuel up anymore. Now, the um, actual diagnosis itself, when he told me that the customer had lost his fuel cap two years prior, he was uh, using a rag in there for a while. Now the rag disappeared, so the mechanic thought possibly the rag went into the tank and got caught in the pickup. Now he had a look in there. He said it was quite clean fuel. The uh, customer, his customer himself is a landscape gardener. So he has a, a aluminum tray back where he's carrying bark and chip and leaves and sticks and dirt and everything like that. So you can imagine what's fallen and vibrating around the side of the tray and going straight into the tank. So how we went about it was we originally Unfortunately, it already jumped the gun and gone for the fuel filter. My point here is that do not replace fuel filters for diagnosis. Do not replace um, fuel filters for testing. Okay, the only time you should replace a fuel filter is when it's due or if it has had a high rate of contamination in there and you can actually prove it. How do you prove if it has got through the, through the fuel system is the other way you go about it. But the first of all is we need to we need to diagnose the fault first. So that's where you run the eliminator, bypass the fuel filter, bypass everything. An eliminator has its own inbuilt filter. It's not a big filter, it's just a strainer. But if you get fuel from a clean source, and again, avoid filling it up from the vehicle you're testing because that can defeat the purpose. So you go straight into the, into the pump and you drive it, okay? So we drove this thing and it never faulted. Okay, so here we have the eliminator. This is the tank itself designed and um, constructed by Diesel Help Australia. The eliminator comes with a hand primer, 8mm bulb type with a non-return valve in there. We also have a number of clear lines here, so we, we keep it basic. Um, if you want to run longer lines to run the eliminator um, back so you can actually set it up to actually drive, you'll need to buy some extended line we do sell the hose itself, um, but it is readily available from other outlets. So here we have a two meter of uh, eight mil, and we have a one meter of six mil, and one meter of 10 mil, and we have a number of hose clamps that come in the kit, just to basically have you readily available. Now, the key thing with the, a couple of key areas to remember when using the eliminator, is that you must actually set it up so you run a return here, and you run your outlet through here. This is your outlet, actually has a filter inside the tank itself. We also have a vent here because if you run the eliminator um, as a separate supply, you're basically all you're doing is replicating the fuel tank in the, in the vehicle. And of course they have a breather as well. So if you don't have the breather open, it'll suck in and then the vehicle will soon starve for fuel and shut down. The important rule with the eliminator is always replace the fuel every time you use it. And you can use it for petrol and diesel. And make sure you get it from a separate source, so preferably from the, um, from the service station, not from the vehicle you're testing. Defeats the purpose. Now, how we like to hook this up is we take these dust caps off and uh, we like to hook up the clear line. So we'll use the uh, two meter 8 mil on here. Now preferably we'd like to put a hose clamp on there. They do seal on the barb quite nicely without it. So if you want to, you can do up the clamp. Um, we'll show that on the vehicle or anyway. And uh, then you run your return. So I'll just take this off here. And then you can also run your return on this side over here. 
So you hook that up, and then what you do is you actually hook your hand primer on here. Okay, so you actually hook your hand, and I'll leave it in the plastic bag there, but you kind of get the idea. You hook it on there, and then allows you to pump it up to the back of the um, fuel pump itself. Therefore, you eliminate um, any chances of air getting in the system as you go to start it. Okay, so that's all hooked up like that. Um, we have a number of reducers in the Optimus Primer kit that allow you to adapt 6mm to 8mm or 10mm to 8mm depending on the fittings on the actual vehicle. So what we do here is, I'll show an example. So if you're using the uh, quick release fitting, such as here, well that's just a, of course it's a short version, but just for uh, training purposes. And therefore now you have a 100% seal here and you have a 100% seal there. Without a proper quick release fitting, male and female fitting, connecting it to a vehicle with quick release fitting, you will not be able to guarantee you will conceal the air out of the system. Now we'll go and fit it up to the vehicle. Okay, now before we connect the eliminator to the actual fuel footer itself, we're actually going to clean the area with some brake clean because it's important to make sure you get all the dirt cleared away from the area to reduce chance of contamination. Okay, so we've got some brake clean and then we'll grab the airline and we clear that. Now, I've got a couple of pipes ready already set up here. And uh, what we've got here, we've got our um, main pipe I've already got the quick release fitting on here. We've got a really good seal here. We don't need a hose clamp as you um, can see there. So I've got a dust cap ready to go on the pipe. So what I'm gonna do initially is actually connect this up to the actual pipe that runs from the fuel filter to the high pressure pump in a situation where you are actually doing a diagnostics. I strongly advise that you go directly to the pump because as you're aware, as I've explained, these quick release fittings do wear out, the O-rings wear out, and that's where the air can get in and cause a major fault code, or create the, an issue where the vehicle sits overnight and drains back and doesn't start. Okay, so first of all, I've got my line here and I've got my hand primer to help bleed it up. So we're gonna first take off the actual quick release fitting, and you may actually hear it gurgle. And we'll connect this up here and then I'm gonna put the cap over here. Now this actually stops the dirt getting in, also prevents the fuel draining back to the tank because when it comes to starting the vehicle again afterwards, you wanna be able to reduce as much air as possible as getting in. Now the other fitting we're actually gonna to connect to is the return pipe that runs across here and runs back down to the actual vehicle fuel tank. And that comes off there. We have our dust cap ready to cap that off and then we're gonna clip this into here. So this way, what we're doing is we're at the moment have eliminated the whole fuel system back from the fuel footer back to the tank. So there's situations where you can have a block breather, you could have a blocked in tank pump, um, you could have a block pickup, you can have other filters down the line, you can have um, a fuel cooler in line. All these things can prevent the vehicle from starting or could cause a major fault code while running. So as I said, we're going to via these pumps just for training purposes today to minimize the time spent. Um, if you wanted to, to connect up um, to actually run it down the road, well at the moment we've got the tank sitting up here on the engine bay, but to run it down the road, you're gonna have to run some longer line, run it out through the grill so you don't kink it in anything, wrap it around the mirror and uh, then run it in the vehicle. And when you run your return, you can also see if you've got air coming through, that's why we use clear line. So what I'll do now, I'll just give it a few pumps and uh, that'll make sure, you can actually see, I don't know if you can see here, but you've actually got some fuel coming back out of the return line. So that um, shows you the hand pump is pumping through and uh, make sure you've got your return um, fitted up correctly and also your bleed screw removed there. So. What we'll do now is I'll go around and start the vehicle. Now, when you do start up an engine for the first time, it's hot or cold, just remember to be conscious about the oil pressure. So don't rev it up straight away. 
but be prepared to rev it up soon after so you to prevent any air getting in there and cause it to surge. And there you go, starts up straight away. A couple of seconds of idle there. Now we'll give it some sharp revs. And you can see you'll get a lot of air coming through. You see here the fuels we're turning through, we've got a fair bit of air, but don't be too concerned about that. If you do take a, we do prefer you take a test drive, and uh, therefore the air will eventually get out of it. But during idle, it's very hard to get the air to remove from this. So now we'll turn the vehicle off. We know the vehicle runs on a separate fuel supply. So we'll be able to go back to the system then. Now apparently it had before he got onto it, it had already been another workshop and they'd replaced several filters. The reason why they replaced several filters, they were quite blocked up with a lot of dirt. So it led us back to the tank itself. Pulled out the tank and there you go, bingo. Found the block pickup, okay? So once that was all cleaned out, rectified, the vehicle drove fine. My point with, um, with contamination is that you've got to see here, with you have a look at this fuel footer, um, schematic drawing of a fuel footer. Now, the fuel flows through most fuel filters are designed, um, so majority of fuel filters are designed, depending on the system, if it runs two or three um, fuel filters, if an electric pump can change it, any water or any contaminants will actually go through the tube and sit in the bottom, because all diesel fuel filters do have a drain tap on the base of them, or they're meant to anyway, or they have a component or compartment part of the filter, which is what we refer to as a water trap, okay? So when you're actually not replacing fuel filters, into, in the intermediate um, services between that, you must drain this drain tap. And that drain tap must be drained for around about seven to 10 seconds. Allows any water to come out. Now, you might see water in there, and this is a big problem, is that um, we'll, there'll be mechanics and technicians around the place diagnosing every day, and I get this every day. The first thing they're going for is replacing the filter, or they'll remove the filter and inspect it and see water in there. There is nothing wrong with water in a fuel filter. It's just excessive water is a problem. If it's got water in there, it could be a case that hasn't been replaced often enough, or it could be they've picked up bad fuel. But you've got to remember, the water, contamination, petrol, or dirt, or anything contaminants must get through the filter to cause an issue. So how do you go about that? You connect a pipe onto the outlet of the filter, you fill up a container, if you use a hand primer, use the electric key, uh, the electric motor, electric pump in the tank, or use your own hand primer to draw it through. Fill up a container, take a sample, and never be afraid when you actually replace the filter to get a sample. Always get a sample every time you replace the filter. Show your customer, say, look, you've got clean fuel, give them a reward. Don't always give them the bad news you've got dirty fuel. So be conscious about it because it is a, a, a great upsell to be actually say to your customer, hey, you've got clean fuel, keep up the good work, okay? If they get dirty fuel, hey, you wanna watch it here, it's gonna cost you a fortune. So you need to prepare them. They could be getting bad fuel all the time. If they make the change, they might better save it, okay? So it's when fuel, bad fuel gets through the system that it becomes a problem. When diesel fuel is contaminated, either with water, rust, or dirt particles that may have entered the diesel storage tanks, the precision parts inside the fuel injector can become damaged. Any wear to the injector nozzles can lead to a poor spray pattern. Instead of fuel being atomized in the combustion chamber, it sprays a very high pressure jet on the cylinder wall, washing away the layer of lubricating oil and resulting in major engine damages as the piston starts to rub against the cylinder wall. A sticky pintle that results in a leaking injector can drip directly onto the top of the piston. As this fuel is repeatedly burned at high temperatures, the piston can begin to melt, leading to total engine failure. Injectors that have become worn generally need to be serviced or replaced at the first sign of problems in order to prevent major engine damage. So as you saw there before in that last video, 
is you can get contaminants from the fuel tank, from the bowser itself. The other problem where we get contaminants is accidental damage, and that's what we refer to as petrol and diesel. So we've got three photos here. Now, three of these are damages. Um, two is actually from contamination, and one of them is actually a manufacturer component failure. And I mentioned the manufacturer component failure because one of the um, issues with the Ford Ranger BT50 early model, uh, PX1 from 12 model up to the early PX2, around about 15, 16 model, is that they had a component failure, which is a broken spring. Now, I'll show that in um, one of our um, explanations when I show the component explanation and the actual broken spring part of it and how to test it and diagnose it a little bit later on because it has been mistaken by a suction control valve fault once again. So that's a component failure. Now, often, again, mechanics, technicians have been jumped to the wrong conclusion, removing the fuel filter. Oh, there's water in the fuel filter. Again, if the water got past the filter, it's, not a, it's a problem. If the water stays in the filter, it's not a problem. But if it hasn't been cleaned out enough, that fuel, that water will rise and rise, and then it will go into the fuel system. So other contamination I said is petrol, okay? So petrol is a non-lubricant, high-octane fuel. I'm going to make this simple. If you had a customer that drove in and said, hey, I filled up with sand in my engine, and they ran it for five minutes or ten minutes or even one minute, and then they said, I drained it out and I flushed the system out. What would you think would be wrong with the engine? I'm sure if you're a decent mechanic, you know that that system, that engine oil lubricating system is got the potential to fail down the track. Same thing happens with petrol and diesel. It's a sealed system. It's a hydraulic system. It's not worth a risk, okay? But the picture on the left there is a V8 Land Cruiser and it actually ran for a significant amount of time, um, several tanks over a six month period. And what it actually did was the actual fuel shot out of the injector mixed with maybe 50-50 diesel and petrol. So if it's got enough petrol in there, it won't have the hydraulic ability to run. It'll shut down, but you still need to replace the items that the fuels pass through. So you can confirm that by removing the outlet pipes of return on the injectors, um, remove the whole system and inspect it, okay? So inspect the uh, fuel tank if there's any petrol in there. There will be because that's where they filled it up with, but remove the outlet pipe, the return of the injectors. If there's a smell of, de of petrol there, that means the customer has ran it until it's stopped and it's, um, you've got the potential to destroy the whole system. So in this case, this land cruiser continued to actually run. It not only destroyed destroy the fuel system, it's actually drilled a hole through the piston it hit the gudgeon pin, so it actually the fuel comes in, hits the um, high tensile gudgeon pin, and shoots off and went off through the valve itself. So in this situation, when a V8 Land Cruiser that had travelled um, quite a few kilometres over a six month period, and it had quite a significant amount of uh, petrol running through the diesel, and where this vehicle continued to run, so what we believe is she might have ran low on fuel, maybe half a tank and decided to fill it up. And now the injector is injecting fuel through the, um, okay, so the injectors, this is the fuel coming through, okay, and the explosion takes place in here. Now what actually was happening, it had a really good mix of um, petrol and diesel. So what we had taking place was a um, fine stream of diesel mixed with the uh, high octane fuel. Now, diesel has a much higher flash point, but whereas uh, petrol high octane fuel has a lot less because of the octane rating. So, with the heat, the thermal combustion engine is quite running quite hot. The fuel heated up that much, so it actually started to squirt through. And it actually burrowed a hole all the way down to the gudgeon pin on this vehicle. Then the fuel bounced off, the aluminium is quite soft in an engine, and whereas a gudgeon pin is high tensile steel. So the fuel wasn't able to burrow any further, so what it did, it then started to bounce off. And it went back up through the piston on a, on a slight angle, just enough to actually burn through the valve itself, okay? So this is the actual valve, okay? So one of the valves, we believe possibly an exhaust valve, and it actually burrowed a hole all the way through the uh, valve, if that makes sense on the picture. So the other problem here is the center picture was a classic scenario where they've cleaned out the fuel system. Car drove to a stop, full of petrol, shut down, 
went to the workshop, they flushed it out. Now you can't flush it out. There's no way of flushing. Um, you can run diesel through it, but again, it's been in contact with a high octane non-lubricant fuel. This is what happened. The pump exploded on the vehicle. Can imagine what could happen if that car was full of kids, okay? A family and kids going along the highway in the wet, okay? Four days later, that failed. What happens is that pump um, seized, it smashed the side of the pump, it then stopped the whole engine, okay? So it was in gear, could easily lock up. So be aware about what you're gonna do when you decide to leave petrol in it or flush the system out. It's just not worth it. It comes back to duty of care, guys. Now I'd like to explain a little bit about the high pressure pump. There's not a real lot to them that you need to know because I always say, if you're gonna start getting involved in pulling apart fuel pumps and injectors, on common rail systems and non-common rail systems, you'll have to go back to trade school and do a whole new trade on diesel fuel injection systems. So it's about the diagnosing, but you need to understand the important uh, features and functionality of the high pressure pump. So number one, if you have a look at this picture here, we've got a bit of an explanation. So the, uh, the main component is the body itself um, holding everything together as one. And if you have a look uh, here, this feature here is the transfer pump that I always refer to when you can run the eliminator on. So that is what draws the fuel up from the fuel tank. You've probably got around about 90, 95% of diesel fuel systems out there that are still running um, without electric pumps or have the capability of actually not um, requiring an electric pump to continue to run. So most uh, high pressure common rail pumps these days are rotary designed. Um, some of the heavy machinery, which only uh, heavy vehicle mechanics are going to be working on, they will use a system which is more robust um, and an inline design common rail pump. So they can work, these common rail pumps can work anywhere from 0.1 of a bar up to 2,500 bar, and that can be from any driven speed as well. So it's almost like a glorified power steering pump. The faster it rotates, the, the larger the increase in, in the pressure of his, uh, the fuel. So the fuel pressure rises as the speed increases of the pump. They can be driven by timing belts, gears or chains. And um, it's important to know um, how they're actually driven as well because you can get situations where if a timing belt, um, if the pulley comes loose on the front of the timing belt, the gear will spin as well. Or if you have a situation where the, the actual timing chain fails, um, and the vehicle's not starting at all, then you need to find out is the pump actually rotating to start with. So have a look at this picture here. It shows a, um, you've got your fuel suction on this side and on the other side is your fuel pressure rising. So this is particularly for the Delphi model, okay? So this unit here is a transfer pump. It is separate from the high pressure component. That there is low pressure supply. Here is your high pressure development, okay? So the fuel's been drawn in via the um, by here, the inlet medium valve, that's controlling the amount of fuel. It is actually the fuel temperature sensor, okay? So the fuel pressure sensor, as we know, is on the rail. And uh, you have a fuel inlet and a fuel outlet, okay? There's a fuel outlet there and there's a fuel inlet. Okay, so be aware of how it's all set up on the vehicle and where the fuel goes in and out, okay? So um, there's Apart from the actual pumping side of things, and there are procedures um, which we carry out on the vehicle, which again will um, cover in the on-vehicle pump test, okay, where we test the outlet pressure. So, but remember, be mindful that the rail system, the rail sensor itself is monitoring this component as well as the rail and the injectors. So I'm gonna run through a bit of an information description operation. Um, this will cover the injectors in general. We've got Delphi. We've got Delphi is this one over here. Denso, which they designed several um, different um, designs for different applications. And here's your um, Continental Siemens injector here, which is your piezo operation. So one of, the, um, one of the things with common rail injectors, they can cause multiple faults. So they can cause an engine hard to start when hot. And what we do there is to test those um, for an internal leak is we use an injector back leakage kit, which we'll come to shortly. You can also get a misfire running rough. Now that can be picked up on the injector um, back leakage kit test. It can also be picked up on the scan tool 
and can be picked up using a number of other um, diagnostic tools along the way, such as Pico scopes. Um, scopes is a big push these days for petrol mechanics coming into the diesel engine, being able to utilize that scope they've used for the FI car and working on the diesel. Um, injectors will also cause excessive black or white smoke, okay? So excessive black smoke is overfueling. White smoke could be also a matter of it maybe getting too much fuel at the wrong time, so injector nozzles can actually seize open um, due to contamination and such. And also the engine, they'll cause the engine to knock or rattle. It's, it's much easier if I can actually, um, if you look at an old injector to understand how an old injector works is not any different to a common rail injector as such when you're looking at the hydraulic circuit of it. What's changed is the pressure's much higher and they've also now controlled by electronic um, solenoid, either a piezoelectronic solenoid or a um, mechanical shutoff solenoid as such. So basically the operation, we look at this fuel flows through the body itself until it fills up around the needle here. So if you have a look at the needle in the center there, this is an indirect injection nozzle by the way. So it actually has one hole that's exposed. So how it takes place, an injector has a, um, a non-common rail injector has a opening pressure, okay? A predetermined opening pressure set by the manufacturer. Common rail diesels, they vary in injection pressure, okay? So they vary in pressure and it is controlled by the electronics um, from the ECU controlling it. Whereas this opening pressure is controlled by the thickness of the shim or the diameter of the spring or the screw adjustment on the spring. So what happens is it takes place as the hydraulic action takes place here, it fills up around this sack area and it's pushing up against the pintle which exposes the hole. As soon as it exposes the hole, fuel is released and that pintle then slams down and creates that um, fine atomization of spray of fuel. Then whatever fuel is not injected actually returns back up the return spindle and back out in this situation at the top of the injector returns back to the tank. The same situation, the same principle follows with a direct injection. The only difference is it has multiple holes. So the fuel comes in through the top in this one and then it goes down to the sack, fills up the area, push up against the pin, the needle which loads up against the spring tension until it exposes a hole, releases the fuel and injects it in. Okay, so I'm going to go through the actual, a larger exploded view of the injector um, before I actually show you some actual models, actual real components that I've sectioned over. Uh, I've sectionized them to give you a bit of an understanding of what they look like inside. Of course, there's nothing better than actually seeing these parts for real and actually seeing them live um, at our training courses. We can actually pick them up and, and feel them and see them and and look inside, the really uh, close tolerances inside these parts are really important to understand how vital, again, as I say, dust caps are a very vital uh, requirement when working on diesel fuel systems. So how it goes through here is we've got the fuel running down through this um, inlet port here. Now this inlet port in some injectors is formed into the body, in some cases actually screwed into. Now this type is screwed in. If you ever work on one where it's screwed in, when you do actually remove them from the actual engine themselves, make sure you actually hold this with a spanner when you undo the nut. Sometimes a bit of corrosion around there grabs hold of these fittings and just undoing that could actually loosen off that seal area as a gasket in there. Once you break that seal, you may not guarantee to be able to seal it up again and don't expect it to leak fuel because it must have a restriction to create pressure. Like I've said all along, to create pressure, you must, you require restriction. You cannot have a complete uh, restriction totally blocked off, otherwise it's gonna hydraulic lock. Okay, so the system, the fuel pump is feeding this pressure from, um, from the pump through the rail, through the pipes, into the injector, and it goes into this gallery, and then it runs down this fine gallery here, where this area here, the dark blue section, is the injector nozzle. This here is a body, this will have two dowels locating that nozzle in the correct position for the manufacturer specification. There's also another little port off to the side and the fuel runs down around the edge of the nozzle, okay, down to the bottom sack here. So the same principle as the non-common rail diesel. 
This time what we've got though is we've got full control of the return electronically operated. So without, and this is an important thing to understand um, so you understand the operation of the common rail injector, is that a lot of the time, um, well, without, without um, any other system in play, whether you've got power or no power, but when the actual vehicle shuts down, you turn the engine off, you watch the rail pressure drop. When the rail pressure drops, that means the fuel is returning out of the injectors, okay? So the only place that it always returns out of is the injectors. So even with no power on the actual solenoid itself, the fuel will drain out of here. What's not been injected in here, what it does, it overrides, it can't physically override the spindle straight away because it's electronically controlled. So at the right time, when the ECU says number one or number two or three or four or whatever injector is injecting, it applies power here to open it up, to control open and close it by actually injecting more fuel it actually closes it up. So this tolerance here is around about a 0.0004 of a millimetre um, that that actual valve will open and close. Okay, it's a very small tolerance. And the actual internal tolerances are almost the same as well, like the needle in the nozzle itself. So as the fuel goes around there and the power is applied to it up and down, but it doesn't just open it and stay open. It's constantly up and down, up and down at milliseconds. We're talking um absolutely like we're talking around about one millisecond that's open and closing um as i said three to seven injections per stroke so it's constantly open and closing which is monitoring or controlling the pressure and controlling the fuel amount going in so whatever's not used is actually returning constantly back up here around the shaft and there's a little this valve which i showed um or which i show you in the, um, in the real actual demonstration of the component, which we have a, uh, a sample of, um, actually shows a tiny little hole where the fuel runs around, comes up the side and returns out. But under full pressure, it actually doesn't leak out around here because the actual movement, the fast movement, the high pressure there, the fuel is actually sealing off the gap. It's only that when it actually starts to wear the valve in this area here, that it actually poses a problem that it loses the hydraulic ability. So once that happens, it bypasses past you at a great rate. And what we get is excessive back leakage or excessive fuel return. Thus, that is why we, why we actually perform the on-vehicle injector back leakage test to look for an internal leak. If you have a nozzle playing up as such, like internal leak down here, you probably you're not going to see a problem where it's going to cause high back leakage at the nozzle injector. If you have a leak, what will actually happen is the injector may actually leak out here and deliver too much fuel, causing a knocking, misfire, rattle. In other cases, you can get the spindle itself actually sticking, like in the Denso system. This valve here is one body and a valve piston and an injector valve and the injector valve body itself. On the Denso system, the earlier model is slightly different and can be, unfortunately, not as reliable due to the change in the body, um, such as heat expansion and contraction, wear and tear and dirty fuel going through. It actually uses the whole body as a valve. So this is where these things tend to, the actual command piston itself tends to stick in the body the injector stays open for a lot longer, thus injecting too much fuel, causing that nasty rattle. Now, in the end result of that is that you can actually put a crack in the piston or a hole in the piston if it gets the wrong fuel. So they also use uh, an internal leak path on these and an orifice that feeds in from here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna now show you a few examples that I've got of um, sectionized injectors and show you some of the benefits and features of them. Um, just, to, just to cap that off, I just want to run through some of the features of the injectors themselves. So injectors are controlled by um, the ECUs controlling the injector drive module. Sometimes the drive module is internally inside the ECU or it may be external. And um, that they're actually generating quite a whole high amperage. Okay, So a 12 volt system has the capability of creating anything from 0 up to 150 volts. And they're usually running around about 50 to 70, possibly 70 amps on some of the later model 
um, vehicles. What it uses, uses an internal capacitor in the injector drive module. The capacitor stores it and it amplifies and creates a much um, higher amperage to control the injectors. If there's not enough voltage there, so if you have a starter motor drawing high current, that will prevent the injectors actually getting enough power to operate and, and operate and actually inject fuel. So if you've got a vehicle starting, uh, well not starting, but cranking over really, really excessively fast on the starter motor, feels like a brand new starter motor and doesn't start, have a look at your voltage drop. What we've seen, anything drops below 10.3 is enough to shut down a whole system, okay? So I'll show you these components now and then we'll move along to some further um, information about actually diagnosing the injectors using the feedback values and also using the return back leakage test kit.